still not really getting to our first real um, normal content lecture, but we couldn't not talk about Hurricane Katrina in this class on the 10-year the anniversary of Katrina. The 10-year anniversary is, is this coming uh, Saturday, but um, this, this is a very important story personally for me, for some of you guys, um, but also for our school and, and how we've defined our program. And we've made a strong commitment to trying to help uh, our friends in Louisiana recover. And so this is a, a, a deeply felt thing for a lot of us. So, so I'll ask your indulgence. We're going to talk about Katrina here uh, today. And so you guys, again, as always, interrupt me if you guys have questions or something isn't making sense. Hopefully, the audio in this room, our brand new room, uh, it will be working OK. But um, the audio might be a little quiet. So when that, when that comes up, you guys strain your ears, and hopefully you'll be able to hear stuff. Um, so what I want to talk about is, is Katrina today as an example of a failed management of the coast. When we talk about these things in ESRM, water issues, power issues, um, access to places to recreate, that kind of stuff, some people in some circles might say that's a bit elitist or this is, oh, that's you people thinking this or that. These things are not elitists that we talk about. These things are fundamental human rights. These things are fundamental um, ways I would argue we should be behaving. And the fact that everybody else wasn't worried about the drought until just now doesn't mean that the drought wasn't real or that our water resource management challenges weren't real. And so one of the big challenges that you guys all have, that we all have, is when we're not in a crisis, how do we communicate to folks that these challenges are real. And this just isn't some other interest group and some other people trying to get money from some entity or something that are trying to drum up support. That, that these really are, there are real challenges. And these things don't go away just because people aren't writing newspaper stories about them or, or anything like that. Katrina um, is a, has become a huge thing, a cultural thing, not just for our, the folks that were in the affected areas, but um, it's come to mean everything. I just heard the big um, chemical storage plant in China that just blew up uh, last week. People, I heard a reporter talking about it and saying that this is, one reporter said, is this China's Katrina? And someone else said, yes, this is China's Katrina. When the Deepwater Horizon happened, people said, this is Obama's Katrina. So Katrina has now um, uh, taken on life way beyond just the, the local area, and it's really come to symbolize a whole lot of dysfunction, a whole lot of ineffectual leadership, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, let's talk about what happened. So this was this was ten years ago, and uh, and I had just moved two weeks beforehand. I had just moved down from Stanford with my family, and uh, my wife has a had a job here. I have a job here. My son was in preschool over there. In my previous position, I, I had a lot of flexibility, right? I could do what I want. I, could, I didn't do really in teaching and this and that because I was told, quote, unquote, you're too smart to teach. Like, you know, you should do this other stuff. As if stupid people teach, um, which, you know, there's, there's a lot of issues why I left Stanford. But, but um, um, suffice it to say, it was wonderful that I had all this freedom. We moved down here, and all of a sudden, you know, I have these classes with you guys, which are great. My wife has all her classes. My son is in a new school. We have boxes that need to be unpacked. And all of a sudden, I felt very frustrated. I didn't know what to do because it looked like my country was imploding around me. And you guys all remember this or remember aspects of this. And so we actually, I actually threw out all my lesson plans and all, kind of like this way. <laughs> I threw out all my lesson plans and all my classes, regardless, of not just my coastal class, cons bio, all these other classes. And we just talked about coastal management for the first basically two weeks. And the lesson plan was, let's open the newspaper. Oh my God, did you see this? And then, oh geez, that happened today. And so, um, so those lessons, we are still learning. We've, not, we've, we've learned some things, some things have gotten better, but we're still learning from uh, what happened uh, 10 years ago. Uh, there's a great story today in the New York Times, and I would, I'll, I'll post a link to this. I would hope you guys all check this out. Um, there's a lot of great coverage that's going on in a lot of different uh, media outlets. Um, for many of our friends in New Orleans, they are shying away from these things because while it's important to commemorate these things and it's important to talk about what happened, what, we, what changed, 
for the folks that were directly affected by this, um, it can be very painful to, to be reminded of these things. But, but this, this uh, story in the New York Times is really good. I would encourage you guys to look at it. And they um, highlight different stories um, from different parts of the city of New Orleans. And that's what we're looking at. What we're looking at is a, a, a satellite view looking down. This top big thing right here is this big giant uh, lake. It's actually connected to the ocean, so it's not technically a lake, but it's called Lake Pontchartrain. And, um, and this is a big body of water. This thing right here is the Mississippi River. And there's a lot of crazy things in Louisiana. Uh, one of which is it's hard to figure out what, what the Mississippi River does, right? Because when we look at a map, we go, oh, it comes from the northern part of the country and it drains south. And it does, but when you're in New Orleans, sometimes the river flows north. So the river is coming from here and it's wrapping around. It's going, boo, 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 boo. it's going down here to the right. And then it's going out to the Gulf of Mexico to the, to the lower right off the screen. So sometimes when you're here, you see the water flowing north and you're the, what? You know, this doesn't make sense. Um, I think what we'll do, let's try this. So this is the Treme. This, this is one neighborhood in the New Orleans. The culture is deep in these roots around here. I mean, it was always musically oriented. It used to be mostly all musicians, all family, colored. All the musicians, they always hung out in the trim. Once the music started, everybody would be out on their porches. From the eldest to the, the youngest, you know. Parties all the time. People get birthday parties at all the balls you see. Ursuline and Robson had two balls of catacomb, and those joints would be popping. Most of them are closed up now. The people on here, they didn't come back. I would love to be able to buy a piece of property in this neighborhood and have my kids grow up the way I did. It's above my pay grade. The neighborhood is a different neighborhood now. It's not the real six ward no more. All these people come and buying all the property up. It changes like a almost a gated community. And they don't want this culture to keep going. Only time you really see some culture around is when they have a big funeral at the funeral home where everybody knows everybody. And you see the old faces that you used to see, you know. Then it feels like the old place again, but those people are only here for a little while. A procession, and people call those people call that a second line. So the first line are the people that carry the body, or the or the, or if it's a wedding, the you know, the the the, the main activity, and then the second line is come the musicians and then everybody else comes behind. So that's what you guys are seeing right there. So the Treme is the oldest African-American, continuously occupied African-American uh, neighborhood in the uh, US. And it's a place that was made famous by the um, HBO series Treme. But a lot of, a lot of the, the traditions of music and uh, Mardi Gras stuff um, that you guys think of when you think of New Orleans came from Treme. So, uh, so uh, things have changed in the last 10 years. We'll talk about in a second what happened, but, but things have changed. As with everything, nothing is simple. Some things have improved, absolutely. Some things have not improved, most definitely. One of the things is the city is uh, numerically smaller. It's, it's getting closer every year. It's getting, there's more and more folks coming. But what's happening is we're seeing a shift as to who has uh, the, the demographics of the city 10 years after Katrina versus the demographics of the city uh, in 2005. Um, and, and one thing that you're seeing, so it's important to say for those of you that have not been to New Orleans, um, this is the largest city in the South that wasn't destroyed in the Civil War. All these other things, Savannah, uh, Atlanta, all these major metropolises in the Civil War were burned. Either, either they fought battles there or invading armies north or south uh, burned or looted or destroyed. New Orleans escaped all that. And so we have this unique cultural history, this unique architectural history, all this unique stuff wasn't sort of 
re-zeroed in the mid 1800s. So there's, there's all kinds of neat things going on in New Orleans, all kinds of horrible things that went on there. But it's been this, this continuous melting pot, this continuous melting of cultures. Irish folks, obviously the slaves, Native Americans, um, and it goes on and on and on. And so Katrina has in effect acted as the newest cultural shaken up uh, thing. And so one of the things we're seeing here is uh, the shift in terms of the white population, which generally, not, not by any means entirely, but generally corresponds to wealthier uh, levels of income and the African-American population, which generally corresponds to, on average, a lower uh, level of income, we're seeing a shift. And basically what we're seeing is some areas of the city pop back really quickly. Some areas of the city that were flooded and damaged and destroyed. Others, not so much. And uh, parts of the city that were most heavily affected, where, because it was floodwaters, were the lowest parts of the city. The lowest parts of the city historically were the least desirable, on average, the least desirable. And so those tended to be where the poorer folks concentrated, and those tended to be disproportionately African American. And so there are all kinds of overtones in this management story. There's, there's racial justice and economic issues and historic legacies of policies, etc. But what you're seeing here is um, the uh, tan color, the goldenrod color, are areas where the percentage of white residents has increased in the past ten, in the wake of the storm, in the past 10 years. And areas that are outlined in black, such as right here, are areas where the proportion of African American folks decreased. Because obviously there's more than just black and white here. There's Latinos and Asian Americans and all kinds of other folks. But so what you're seeing is it's not a homogeneous picture. It's not the whole city became goldenrod. It's not the whole city is outlined in black. It's very much a mixed story. And so it's very easy. And we're seeing this more and more in our world. We saw this with the oil spill. We'll talk about this when we get to our oil spill discussions. Um, it's very, very easy to get a misimpression, especially with social media. It's very easy to go to one spot, I don't know, uh, right up here by the lake and say, oh, this hasn't changed that much, or stuff is basically more or less kind of the way it was. Go to the French Quarter, oh, this stuff's, the street's clean. In fact, in some cases, things are better. We improved some of the infrastructure. So in places like the Central Business District, down over here, some of the stuff is way better than it was before. So hey, something's got better. And so you're, unless you're taking a, a scholarly approach, unless you're looking at a holistically, uh, a, 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 taking a holistic take on the story, it's easy to get an incorrect impression. And with social media, the way things get amplified, and a great example of this is with Katrina. We'll talk about this in a second. I'll show you some videos. Um, uh, it's very easy for a misimpression to become a dominant impression and for folks to take away an incorrect understanding of the true reality of the management situation. And so, so New Orleans, very patchy in terms of the response. OK. Um, uh, I'm not trying to pick on any particular leaders or whatever, but it's important to call a spade a spade, okay? And again, we'll talk about Katrina in a second, but let, let's continue with this contextual stuff. This is President Bush's final news conference, uh, 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 official news conference from the White House while he was president as he's exiting. And this is a whole long news conference that I've cut out most of it. I've just, I've just left in the part about Katrina. And so let's see if we can get this to play. So it's poor audio, but there's a reporter saying, hey, can you tell me what happened with, uh, you know, w w reflect on your legacy. What have you done wrong in your presidency? Presidency, why? Iraq war, everything. And this is what he says. Got you. Uh, I, I have often said that uh, history will look back and determine that which could have been done better or, um, you know, mistakes I made. It, clearly putting a mission accomplished on an aircraft carrier was a mistake. It sent the wrong message. We were trying to say something differently, but nevertheless it conveyed a different message. Obviously some of my rhetoric has been a mistake. Um, I thought long and hard about Katrina. You know, could I have done something differently? like land Air Force One, either New Orleans or Baton Rouge. Okay, what he's talking about there is um, he flew a couple days after the, the 
flooding happened, he flew over in his airplane, in the Air Force One, and that's what he's talking about. So uh, he never went and visited, at least initially, did not go and visit the city. And so, so when um, a reporter asked the President of the United States what he messed up on, his first reflection is, oh, my airplane trip. The problem with that and, uh, is that um, law enforcement would have been pulled away from the mission. And then your questions, I suspect, would have been, how could you possibly have flown Air Force One into Baton Rouge and police officers that were needed uh, to expedite traffic out of New Orleans were taken off the task to look after you? Um. Oh, lost the audio. Okay, well, that sucks. Um, he goes on to say, uh, uh, people said we didn't do anything, I'm paraphrasing him now, um, but we had a bunch of helicopter drivers, which is strange because he was supposedly a pilot, and to call a person that drives a helicopter a helicopter driver was a bit strange, but in any event, he calls them helicopter drivers, and he said, we were there. We were saving people. The Coast Guard was there. The rest of the federal government was not. Um, and so, so that, that, was his, that was your president's assessment of what went wrong, was um, they were there, and, um, and he was worried about if he should land his airplane or not. <clears throat> These are the images right after Katrina. Uh, difficult to see, difficult to watch. I would argue... And in my mind, when I saw this stuff, this is what I thought about. Did you guys ever see this? Have you guys seen this painting? It's a famous painting in the Louvre in, in Paris. This is Twitter of the day. This is CNN back in, in um, France in the early 1800s. So the story, the, so th this painting is big. This painting is the size of the wall here. It's a really cool oil painting. I like it a lot. It's called the... Um, uh, the Raft of the Medusa. The, does anybody know the story of the Raft of the Medusa? Okay, so this is, so tell me if anything sounds, might be pertaining to what happened in New Orleans here. Okay, so this was, uh, back in the day, uh, there's um, a big, uh, uh, you know, imperial rule and the traditional elites are ruling France. And so how it worked back in the day is if you ki kiss the butt of someone, you got into a position of power, and then you use that to make money for yourself, etc. So in this case, we're talking about the maritime prowess of France, and they had these, and they had these vessels, and they they'd go and do trading. Okay. Uh, the he and so there's a fleet that goes there's a, that's going from at, from France over to North Africa. So they'd go do that. Now the sailors are professional sailors. the 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 captain of the boat of the ship is a is a captain. But the administrative heads, the admirals, they're all political appointees. They don't know, generally speaking, anything about the ocean. They're there because they were the son of someone or someone got a favor, and so they're not necessarily the most effective guys. So these, this fleet, this French fleet, is all this trading, have these vessels full of goods. They're getting ready to sail back to France. Getting ready to sail back. And the, the guys in charge, the, the, you know, the sailor guys say, whoa, dude, it looks kind of sketch. Maybe we shouldn't go out of the harbor today. And the admiral says, shut up, you idiot. Yes, we're going to go across. We're going to get this back, and I'm going to make some crazy skrilla on all this stuff. So we're going. So they leave har the harbor, and sure enough, a big storm system comes in, and the ships are the fleet's destroyed. The narrative that comes out and is push acro pushed across France is, oh, these noble... Frenchmen, ah, oh, they were so great, and they were just dashed by the, an act of God, and we had no control over what's going on. Too bad. We're very sorry. Soldier on, kind of thing. There were a few survivors. And so one of the vessels was called the Medusa, and so there were some survivors, and some of them got on a little, cobbled together a lifeboat and everything, and they eventually made it to a fishing port in, north, in, in southern France, they were kind of, you know, dehydrated, everything. They, they kind of laid in bed for a while. And then they, 
they started going back to their families. A, a few, well, not a lot of people, just a handful. But um, it was a complete different story. And so at Jericho, the, 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 the painter of this took this and turned this into a social commentary. So at the time, what you would do if you were an artist, you would go exhibit your paintings in what's called a salon. So you'd go and you have your friends over and you'd show your stuff and go, look at this cool stuff. And I don't know, you'd drink tea and smell like really bad BO or whatever the French do, right? And they would do that and they'd say, oh, this is cool. And they would talk about it, right? And the elites, the powerful, would come together and talk about whatever, philosophy or the color palette or what have you. And so he toured with this painting and eventually took it to France. And essentially, it was a big giant middle finger to the government. He's saying, that's not what, the story that you told isn't what happened. This is the real story. And so, which is, and there's all kinds of things we could spend a whole class talking about this painting, but short version is, um, this guy right here is a slave. So he's one of the guys that, that goes and rescues the, some of the more powerful sailors and stuff. And they cobble this thing together. And if you look at it, there's all this misery, all this human suffering. It's a complete counter narrative to the story as uh, um, the government would like you to know as to what really happened. So when I saw all this stuff going on with Katrina, that's what I was flashing back to. It seemed to be the narrative from the government that we're coming, yep, help is on its way, don't you worry, we got it under control, versus people on the roof saying, the water's coming up, get me the heck out of here, and nobody's getting them the heck out of there, right? Okay, so here's another, this, this might also be a little bit low in terms of the audio, so if you guys could listen. So this is, just to be clear, this is day 10 after the flooding happened. This is not the next day or anything like that. So we'll watch the whole story. It goes on for about five or six minutes. Still finding and removing the living from New Orleans. We begin with this report from Jeffrey Kay of KCET Los Angeles. We may not be back in this area. And they're talking 60 to 80 days before the water goes down. I understand. So I strongly urge you to get out now. Coaxing residents to abandon their homes is not in the job description of Louisiana State Wildlife and Fisheries agents. I understand your loyalty to your animals, but you're going to run out of food and water, and you need to take care of yourself right now. Normally, this time of the year, game wardens would be out in the countryside for the opening of the dove hunting season. But with some 60% of the city of New Orleans waterlogged, their department has dispersed a flotilla of flat bottom boats for search and rescue missions. A lot of locals are used to flooding, and they still think this thing's going to go down in a couple days. So we're having a hard time getting it in their head. This could still be a few weeks before we get, even with them pumping out right now, getting all the water out. Even leave. if it's a real right. elderly, serious medical issue, leave. then we may force them to leave. Yeah. So if you could tell our airboat operator, he's number one, you're number two, and when we get to 27, we're going to start sending them out to the east. Teams from Louisiana and around the south have used hundreds of boats. Armed personnel, including sheriff's deputies from as far away as Albuquerque, provided escorts. Officials say the heavy weaponry and bulletproof vests were necessary protection. They, they weren't. They about a repeat of earlier incidents in which snipers had fired at police and That's not workers. true. That never happened. As a law enforcement, I know with a dream I'd have to wear body armor to come rescue people, unfortunately. But, you know, I think the last few days they've gotten it under control. We really haven't had any incidents. And, uh, but you're wearing it. It's I'm wearing it because concern. you don't know. I mean, there's a lot of people that's been in here for a week, and I'm sure there might be a sense of cabin fever, and they're, they're just, they don't know who to trust maybe at this point. This operation yesterday was in southwest New Orleans, close to the Garden District. Throughout the city, the waters are gradually receding but they're contaminated by toxics and waste. And the flooded neighborhoods lack basic services, including communication. Many stranded residents haven't heard about the extent of the damage, and thousands have insisted on staying put. Now I saw the water, and then I was like, well, you know, it's gonna rise up a little bit, but I didn't expect it to go this bad, so by the time it, it got to this point, I was like, well, I might as well just stay. Why? Uh, it really ain't no bother to me. Do you have any power? No, sir. Running water? 
No, sir. Sewage? No, sir. Because I, I make do. Somehow, some way. Independent of state agents, National Guard troops conducted their own search and rescue operations in heavy trucks. The U.S. Coast Guard patrolled from the air, and private boat owners came to offer aid. Shannon Gamewell brought his boat to New Orleans from Arkansas to be a nautical good Samaritan. I just talked to my wife and I said, look, if you were here and Hallie was here, I would want somebody like me coming to get you. You know, and, and that's not, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm just a redneck with a mud buddy, you know, but in this type of situation, that helps. We got transportation till we leave. We just here till that water go down, then we gonna go on out. Gamewell came across Shirley Johnson and her family and loaned her his cell phone so she could call her daughter in Atlanta. Tiffany, this is Shirley. Yay! We still at home. We waiting for the water to go down. I'm so glad to hear from y'all because we've been thinking and worried. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's okay, Shirley. It's all right. It's okay. So we gonna be there. Later, as seen in video shot by a NewsHour producer, Gamewell encountered Warren Mahoney, a stroke patient. Since I had this stroke, I, you know, I need my medication and stuff like that. I had his medicine. Yeah. I got enough medicine to last two, a couple of days, but I need that blood pressure medicine. Now, you stand right there, okay? Put your cane down, and, and I mean, use, use your cane. Lean on your cane, because I'm coming. I've got to come up, okay? Gamewell helped Mahoney to his boat. Flagged down a passing Air Force helicopter. and helped carry the disabled man to the chopper so he could be evacuated. Anybody home? Game wardens hoping to find more residents like Mahoney yelled through open doors and windows. The welfare of pets was a main reason many people chose not to evacuate. Carolyn Mitchell was worried about the fate of the animals in the house she shared with three other people. How long do you figure you can stay here? Uh, another couple of days. So, that, I mean, we are, we've been trying to get out and make plans, so, so we just we really want to make sure that our animals will be taken care of until we go. Thank you all. I appreciate this. No problem. Eventually, game wardens persuaded the residents to put their own safety before that of their animals. They quickly packed belongings and were evacuated. In the next few days, officials may use more than persuasion. The New Orleans mayor has ordered all residents to leave the city. Margaret Warner has more on this story. She spoke with so New Orleans we'll just police captain Marlon this. DeFillo a short time ago. He's the commander of the Public Affairs Department. Captain DeFillo, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Give us the latest on the evacuations. How many people were you able to evacuate today? Uh, a couple of hundred, nearly 1,000 individuals we've evacuated, we've evacuated today. Um, we still have a lot more people who are willing to be evacuated, and that's where we stand right now. Do you have a good sense of how many people there are and say where they are? So if you want to go in and get them, you can? Many of the areas that we're, we're focusing on now are public housing developments where we have a number of people who remain in their homes on the second and third floors. Uh, their first floor is underwater. But we are working to, mainly at this point, to relieve the city of those folks who are willing to leave the city who have been stranded for the last eight or nine days without food and water. Those are the people that we're concentrating on now. And are you still, are you all delivering food and water to anyone who is stranded, whether, whether voluntarily or whether they're refusing to leave? Yes, we are. But the, that can only go for so long. You know, we don't know if this is going to last a week, two weeks, a month, six months. So there is a mandatory evacuation because it is unsafe, it is unhealthy to be in the city at this time. We have not uh, completed the recovery process. We are still recovering, rescuing people. <clears throat> There is no running water, there is no electricity. So it's, it is a hazardous situation at this time. So when do you think you may have to resort to forceful measures? 
let me just say that the New Orleanians are smart. And once we began to tell them that there are no other options, that, that uh, it is apparent that you have to leave your home, and many folks will, will heed to that warning. Many folks, once you take those options away, they will comply and, uh, and, and leave. So in other words, you're saying that the mayor's new order last night, when you're able to tell folks that, that that's having an effect. That some okay, so they go on for a while. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the information that came out initially that um, women were being uh, raped in, the, in, in some of the um, shelter areas, that snipers were shooting at people, almost none of those things were true. But again, in this chaotic situation, these, these rumors got going and it really complicated the, the initial response to this. Because for example, you saw those uh, uh, folks going around with body armor on. You know, you can imagine it's you know, 95 degrees out and 95% humidity. You're maybe not as, as spry as you otherwise would be, et cetera. So this is what started happening, right? A day or so after Katrina, we started seeing this stuff. What's going on? Why are there people in the convention center? Why are there people in the, the, the football stadium, the, these areas of people evacuated to? What's going on? And then they were there for a day. Okay, why were they there for a second day? Why were they there for a third day? What the heck was going on? Massive, massive, ineffectual um, uh, government, uh, leadership. So I would argue that all that stuff was completely known totally known, predicted. There was newspaper stories written about this. Um, uh, you know, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. We knew. A friend of mine from, Louisiana, from New Orleans told me in the late 90s, hey, you should come down to Mardi Gras. And I said, oh, I've been trying to come to Mardi Gras for a while, but you know, we keep trying, I keep forgetting and I don't schedule a road trip and stuff. He goes, well, you should come because the next hurricane that hits, the city's gone. So, I mean, I mean this is not an unknown thing just like earthquakes in California, just like uh, sea level rise, right? Um, it, the, people act shocked when these events unfold, but the reality is um, uh, that falls on us, that falls to you and I, the folks that, that have taken the time to understand, in this case, in the case of our class, the coastal zone, to impress upon people that we really need to, need to get serious about this. So let's talk about uh, what was going on with that. So. An example that comes to mind when we talk about this stuff and a lot of these coastal management challenges is the story. Let me know the story of Troy. So what, what, what happened in Troy? So they were fighting against the mm -hmm. and they came over on their boat. They fought for a long time. Right. Off. Why did they fight? For the woman. Cassandra. Yeah. This lady. The lady. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Took but, That was, it, it was a lady yeah. is what caused it, supposedly, right? Because guys wrote the story. So clearly it was a lady that caused the problem. Um, she, so the story goes, she foresaw this bad stuff happening, right? So she was blessed with the gift of, of, of seeing the future. So she said, oh my God, this is going to happen. But she was also cursed with... Um, the um, situation that no one would believe what she said. She's like, oh my God, this bad stuff's gonna happen. Like, uh-huh, yeah, right, uh-huh, yeah, right, right. Nobody really listens. So what we, what we typically take away from the, the Trojan, the, the story of the siege of Troy was the, the Trojan horse, right? Where all the, the Greek guys hide inside and they spring out and they, they trick them, right? But what I think about is I think about this lady that was saying, oh my God, there's this problem coming. And people are like, yeah, please. You don't know what you're talking about. So we have, uh, this is a book called The March of Folly that ca categorized and cataloged several uh, major, major examples of incredible government missteps and incredible failures of leadership. And so in this book that came out in 84, um, the, the allowing a big giant wooden horse into your city would maybe be one thing that was not the smartest thing to do. Um, uh, the next would be uh, that, that uh, you know, the next sort of big huge one would be um, the Catholic Church not listening to the separatists, um, you know, the Martin Luther and all those guys, and it splits the Catholic Church. It was this huge political entity, right? The Catholic Church had armies and stuff, and it leads to this fracturing of this, this one um, institution. Another would be an example, another example would be British lo the British government losing, the UK losing uh, North America. 
um, and not seeing what was going on in North America. Another would be uh, that the author was particularly interested in was the Vietnam War and this folly of trying to engage in, in this activity in this country far away. And then I would argue that in, this, in the context of our coastal class here, there's a couple others we can add. One would be the management of the Gulf Coast leading up to 2005 and all the decisions and lack of decisions that were made. Incredible, you know, the vast majority of our energy, it, despite what you think about oil or gas production, whatever it's, we use that now. And a huge fraction of, where, of, of that supply that goes to the rest of the US of our domestic production comes from that area. Our most valuable fisheries come from that area, seafood that we eat and everything, and allowing it to go away, setting aside all the other things about people's homes and stuff. Horrible idea. And then 2010, I would argue, the management of deep water oil reserves is also a complete joke um, and uh, was one of the drivers that led to the deep water horizon. Another thing that we'll see in our class over and over again is this notion of um, crappy thinking. I don't know how else to say it. Stupid thinking. Incorrect frames of reference. So for example, when we talk about the Gulf Coast, this is what usually jumps into people's heads, right? So we see there's, it's usually political boundaries, usually state boundaries. Here's Florida's over here, and here's Texas over here, blah, 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 blah. Um, the reality is this is a very dynamic system over time, over geological time. And we've had all kinds of things move around. Different, different um, uh, rivers have moved around, different um, uh, ice ages and, and, and ice shields. And that's caused the, the coastline to move a lot in this part of the country. It's very shallow. It's not like our California coast. And so the, from the pink line to the red, to the blue line, excuse me, are, are, is the extent of historic shoreline. So what we're living in in this part of the world is really this recently geologically young mm, alluvial plain, uh, the river mouth, basically, right? And so that has lots of implications. So again, we think that this is the coastline and everybody's basing everything on this. Similarly, one of the things you heard in 2005, this happened, if, I mean, I'm old, I'm older than you guys, right? I'm old and fat. But uh, this actually happened before I was even born. It's even older than me. Oh my God. It's older than a lot of the people that were alive in New Orleans, for example, or in Plaquemines Parish or these areas. This is the last big hurricane to hit New Orleans. This was Hurricane Betsy in 1965 when President Lyndon Johnson was president. And this hurricane hit, caused flooding in the Lower Ninth and in these various places. And the President of the United States came down, got, took a little boat ride, walked off and said, this will never happen again. And started what became known as the flood protection system, the levee system you've heard so much about around New Orleans to quote unquote protect you from, from such an event happening again. This is, the, this is the storm track, if you guys have not seen one of these before. So what we're seeing is this is the, this is the route of this hurricane. So this hurricane is coming from off, it starts off of uh, Africa and in the central Atlantic, and it comes up, and the color here refers to the speed of the winds, and then this is the actual, this is the eye, this is the center of the storm where it went. So when I'm going up to the eastern seaboard, nope, just kidding, I'm going, again. Hey, screw it, Florida, no, I'm going to come right up here. As soon as these hurricanes leave the wet, hot, water of the ocean, they start to lose power. And so that's what you're seeing here. So it's, it's this sort of blood red color, deep purple red color. It comes and hits land and it becomes just red and just yellow and green and eventually just becomes a you know, big storm by the time it gets farther up, uh, more north. So this is what people were saying. We had an incorrect frame of reference because we were thinking about political boundaries. One. Two, we had an incorrect frame of reference, at least for the folks in New Orleans, because nothing had hit them. They said, well, uh, you know, I, I, in recent memory, I don't remember a storm hitting that area. That's totally foolish. This is all, this is the track of all the tropical storms. And a tropical storm is just a weaker version of a hurricane. Hurricanes and a major, and major hurricanes. Just differences in the, the speed of the wind. These are all the tracks from Hurricane Betsy to uh, leading up to Katrina. So if you are from this area, the fact that you maybe lucked out and weren't whacked by a particular storm at your house, that's total luck, right? That's total luck. 
So simply sticking your head in the sand and saying, we're okay, is incorrect. It's also important to say here that I'm not trying to pick on our friends in Louisiana. Uh, we used to have a fishing pier out at Magoo. We, do not, we no longer have a fishing pier. It was destroyed by a hurricane in 1923. So we do get hurricanes here too. Rare, historically, but thanks to climate change, we'll be getting a lot more hurricanes. So, so you guys get to experience maybe uh, some of this stuff. So the point is um, risk, properly dealing with risk. We don't need to see this and freak out and go live up in Alaska or something, right? But we need to talk as adults. This is, this is, this is the reality, right? This is the reality we're dealing with. And hurricanes don't give a crap as to what county you're in or what parish you're in or what state you're in. They're just going to do their due. Um, and then the big part of this that is often totally unappreciated, despite what people say, is the importance of a healthy coastal ecosystem. So in this case, we're talking about our wetlands. This image right here on the bottom is of our San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, in the lower 48 states, so if we exclude Hawaii, exclude Alaska, um, over the last 150 odd years, we've lost something like a bit over half of just the absolute raw acreage of wetland areas. If we talk about California, we have the unfortunate distinction of having the greatest proportional loss of wetlands. If we talk about areas like the San Francisco Bay Area here, where I have a picture below, most of the gray stuff you see, that's all urbanized, that's all concretized, that's all, that's all hardened landscape. That really, that was, that was open water uh, before the gold rush happened. Essentially, we strip mined the Sierra Nevada mountains with, with hydrologic, with, with giant fire hoses, basically, to look for gold. And all that sediment went into the rivers. The rivers went into the coastal plain. The coastal plain dumped into these estuaries. And this filled in San Francisco Bay, essentially. So we've lost 91% of our wetlands. The 9% that remain aren't kick butt. The 9% that remain aren't, aren't this like fantastic, you know, perfect place, but they're at least 9% of something left. So California, we have the unfortunate distinction of having the greatest proportional loss. Louisiana has the distinction of the greatest absolute acreage loss. Okay, so if we're just talking about outright numbers, Louisiana wins. If we're talking about proportional loss, California wins in this really dubious race that we're, we're engaged with here. Um, this is what that wetland loss looks like. So um, now you guys, you guys are or maybe don't know your Louisiana geography. Here's that big lake I mentioned, that Lake Pontchartrain. It's actually connected to the ocean, but the big lake. Here's the city of New Orleans. You can see this, the, the classic crescent, the bow, the bend in the river. Um, and then this is the Mississippi River brrr, going on down here to the so-called bird's foot delta because it looks like a heron's foot or a, a, a seabird's foot, like splayed out. And basically, the red and yellow are bad. Uh, when this map was, oh look, I left off an extra zero. Sorry, this is 2000 to 2050. So this is, so this was created. This map, this famous map, was created in the late 90s, um, and this showed what had already happened in red and what was almost surely going to happen in yellow, in terms of loss. And then the gain are in different shades of green. And you don't need any statistics here. You can tell the red and yellow is way outnumbering the light green and dark green. So we're losing this. We're, we're eroding, we're Swiss cheesing out um, our wetlands. And the wetland, if we talk about in the context of coastal management, we've talked about, let's say, the city of New Orleans. There's a whole, there's a much larger story than just the city of New Orleans. But if we take that as an example, we had, look, here, here's, if we're a storm, whoa, we get, oh, there's all this crap, arr, slowing us down, slowing us down, slowing us down, cutting off access to that, that hot water that's going to, keep our winds blowing really strongly and all this and that. And so it's just going to come whack and, and, and hit us after it's gone over what people might call a speed bump here of this, what, these wetlands. Wooded wetlands, herbaceous wetlands. Now look what's happened. Now we've cut out all this area. So now instead of hitting the speed bump here, we don't hit the speed bump till more like about here. Right? Ab absolute, direct, clear economic consequences of losing this ecosystem. We can talk about the intrinsic value, the intrinsic worth of these systems. We can talk about 
the importance of bird habitat and everything, which we should, and that is important. But on the thing that maybe everybody can understand, right? Even the politicians can understand this, that um, losing this speed bump means that, that that freight train coming down the tracks is gonna be going that much faster when it hits you. And so if we, if we zoom into this little area right here, here's an animation just showing you guys what this looks like. Um, and so this, so brown is existing. This is in the 50s, or 30s into the 50s, and then it's all just Swiss cheesing away. So red has now become subtitle habitat. So I'll show you a video in a little bit um, to, to show you what it looks like right now. But, but it is, this is incredibly real. This is not some theoretical thing. This is not some distant thing. This is, this is massive loss right in everybody's face. This is what it looks like. Uh, this is one of, our, one of our trips to Louisiana. This is some of your, your colleagues or your former colleagues. And what we're looking at here, we're on a freeway called the 23, and we're looking at, and what you see there are cypress trees, right? The classic Louisiana swamp tree. Um, they are a plant, just to be clear. They're not an alga. So that they, they do really well in areas that have water, standing water for a long period of time. They cannot live purely in water. They can, they can take a lot of water you know, inundation, but they have to start life at least on land. Seeds don't germinate in salt water, despite what people say. So what's going on is when you guys look across and it looks like there's a lake full of trees, that wasn't a lake when these trees were born. When it was born, this was, this was land, maybe muddy land, but it was land. And so what you're seeing now is you're seeing these remnant skeletal trees because they're dying. They can't live underwater and they're starting to die. And so as, as they die, it just, the cycle just continues and goes on. And this particular place is down sort of the, the farthest place you can drive to on a road down the bird's foot delta. This is, uh, I'll show you guys what this looks like. Now this might get crazy loud. So I might have to turn it down. This is a helicopter. We had a, a media tour last week in uh, New Orleans and this is uh, some video we shot. So I just wanna show you guys what this looks like. So, okay, so we're about to take off in this helicopter. So this is, and this is about, um, well, this is right on the southern edge of New Orleans. So this is in a, uh, on the Orleans Plaquemines Parish boundary, right where um, we do a lot of our restoration work. Okay, there you go. So, um, okay, so we're flying now. So this is, for, uh, okay, hold on. This all should be swamp. This all should be treed areas, okay? What we're seeing here is, and, this, and this, so this is not just one, one person didn't make a bad decision. This is development, right? This is all, these are all these houses. In this case, it's a golf course that's gone in here. And we're gonna fly and we're gonna move. So we're now a little, a little bit south of New Orleans. We're gonna fly uh, eastward. And so here we go. Okay, so we're flying eastward right now, going over. So this looks fairly good. This is one of our sites. This is one of our uh, areas where we're, um, working on managing this and trying to make more of these this tree habitat, make more of this bottomland harbor for us. Now we're getting up close. The thing right in front of us right now is the Mississippi River. So here's the Mississippi River. We're flying over it, or about to fly over it now. And you can see, um, incredibly important, all this barge traffic, grain. Not a lot of high-end stuff goes through the port, but a lot of bulk stuff, coal, uh, corn, that kind of stuff. And then right over here, this is St. Bernard Parish. Um, so here's the city of New Orleans. The river's coming through here, boom, and going down. So it's going, flowing towards, towards the, the, or the bottom of the screen now. Again, St. Bernard Paris, the lower ninth ward you've heard so much about is just, uh, is just right up about over here. Um, this is St. Bernard Parish. This is where we stay some years when we're working there. And check it out, here's a little teeny patch of minuscule forest and then it's all cut down. <laughs> cut down, all this is cut down, <laughs> cut down. Um, and now we're continuing to fly east over this industrial, so this is a large industrial area, a lot of oil refineries here. Great, look at that, good times. Now we're keeping going east, we're moving to an area called New Orleans East, after we get past all the uh, oil storage tanks. And we're going, now again, this whole area was, um, I mean, there's a mixture, there wasn't just trees, but trees should be the dominant thing we see here. Okay, there's, there's, there should not be a huge amount of herbaceous wetland right here. Now we're keeping going. Okay, now here's a little for, here's a little forested patch. 
This is more like what we think we'd see, but then immediately we lose that. And so it's a little teeny plug, keep going to the right, and we're actually flying towards a national wildlife refuge that used to be forested uh, uh, swamp. But it's not really forested, it's herbaceous. And so not only is it herbaceous, but check it out, it looks like there's a bunch of holes in this area, right? There's a bunch of, uh, there's a lot of standing water. And of course in wetlands there's some land, there's some water. But there's, there's more standing water than should be here. So our management practices have led to the eroding of these, these marshes. And then I zoom in a little bit, and if you look close, you'll see some dead trees and stuff in here that are kind of the remnant skeleton trees. So, so this is what this area is, right? We're not, you just saw the city, right? This is not 60 miles to the Gulf of Mexico. This is, this is now the ocean is right there. And uh, that's our photographer. Um, so, uh, yeah, okay, so there we go. Make sense? Questions? All right. Um, and talk about what's, why are we losing this incredibly important coastal resource? There's several different drivers of this. Um, there is the, the overall background thing that happens, which is we, uh, soils subside. Wetland soils are really, really rich in organics. They have a lot of dead plant. So, so, so the water is there. So they're not really well oxygenated. So the, so the typical aerobic breakdown of, of materials goes very slowly. So therefore, it tends to be real, relatively enriched with decaying plant matter. And so a, a large fraction of the physical space that that soil is occupying is a twig, is a blade of grass, is a stem of a plant kind of thing, right? So if we don't do anything, over time, that plant is going to is going to rot, is going to go away, it's, and that will eventually be converted into carbon dioxide and disappear. So, so naturally, wetlands subside on their own. They will, they will subside. The ground level will start at X, and it'll go a little bit lower. Okay. So there's a background rate of that. But then we've been sucking out a ton of oil and gas from this whole area. So that's exactly like uh, if I had a straw in this, in this, this soda right here, Right? And I started sucking out that straw, the, lay, the level of coke in my glass is going to go down. Same exact principle, right? So we're sucking out the, the material that's taking up space in the ground to the ground lowers. Um, okay. The next thing that's going on is we have this sea level rise again. We have the, 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 the sea levels have changed throughout human history. So there's a background change that goes on with this. But then obviously due to climate change, we've radically sped this up. So we're seeing um, increasing rates of the ocean level rising. So that's working against us. The land is going down, the water is coming up. Uh, second, uh, okay, so then we, we'll talk about this again later, but, but um, we, don't li we don't like risk in our society, supposedly. Insurance companies are fine to let you guys not have insurance, but. But, um, but generally speaking, we have this hyper aversion to, oh my God, we've got to do something. So in the case of um, our story today, we had several really powerful hurricanes in the early part of the last century, and they freaked people out and said, no more. We will dictate this. We will control this. So that started this levying of the Mississippi River. Unfortunately, the, the flooding, the annual flooding of this part of the world is what created these incredible wetlands and these incredibly fertile agricultural areas. So we cut that off and we stopped the flood, but we also stopped the nourishing of the soil. When we stopped the nourishing of the soil, that meant that we couldn't, we couldn't counteract this subsidence thing that was going on. So while subsidence has always been going on throughout time, sea level rise has been going on throughout time, although, although at different rates, levees is something totally new in the last hundred years. We never had walls along our rivers before. Another introduced thing, another novel thing, is this guy off to the right. This is a nutria. This looks like a, sort of a cross between a, a platypus, um, a rat, or a beaver, and yeah, I'll call it a rat. They're, they're, they're funky, right? So they were introduced uh, as fur-bearing critters, 
and they basically escaped escaped control and now they live in the wetlands and they eat a fantastic amount of plant material especially the roots and so while they themselves don't outright destroy a bunch of wetland they really act as nucleating agents so they'll go in in an area and they'll eat it'll gnaw away and they'll create a little little bear patch either in a bank or in a in a in an area of marsh and then it's that much easier for these other forces, wind, uh, fr uh, salt water that, that's gotten squirted into these freshwater wetlands because of these oil and gas canals, and that then that salt water kills the plant. So, so they really help speed up the rate of wetland loss. Um, and so, you, so that's, that's another word for a non-native species, an introduced species. And then, and the, so these top four things are going on every day, every night, every hour, they're constantly going on. Then we have things that are these pulse, these, int these every once in a while things, and hurricanes are the classic example here. All this stuff comes together to, to make us have fewer and fewer uh, acres of wetland. And so the, the um, major response here, the big answer is we need more sediment. We need more stuff on the ground. We need more soil on the surface of the earth. Um, and so this is not rocket science. We know how to do this, at least in the big picture. The question is getting the wherewithal, getting, getting the, the, the folks that make the management decisions to actually do it. The resources to do it and then to do it at a large scale. Okay, this isn't some kind of weird virus that's attacking us that we have to spend years and years figuring out the, gen the genome and this and that. It's basically where we don't have enough sediment anymore. We used to have tons of sediment. Now we take all the sediment that went into South Louisiana and we squirt it out in the middle of the Gulf. And then all that, and then all that sediment out there helps cause things like this massive low oxygen zone and kills all these fish. So it causes all kinds of problems. So the, the solutions by far, the, there's all kinds of things we can do, but the, by far the biggest thing is we need more sediment that is in the water, needs to be able to go on land. The next thing is, we should be reducing the, the sucking on that soda straw, and that would be to reduce water and gas and oil extraction. Uh, next would be to eliminate the nutria. And then um, there's other things we could possibly do that start to get more experimental. We don't know if the, things like fertilizing plants in theory might work, but, but it goes on and on. This is what we have inherited from our bad management. So what we're looking at is uh, an island that should be essentially filling up the whole image. But if you, anybody see anything funky about this island? Or any, any clues as to some potentially artificiality to this island? Straight. Yes, the straight. So nature, with the exception of crystals, nature, generally speaking, abhors a straight line. But if we look at this image right here, we see there's this really long, essentially straight line here. Another thing here, that's a canal. So that's a canal that's been put in to extract oil, or to do some oil and gas drilling, basically. The idea is, this used to be a big, huge chunk of marsh. You can't get a, whatever, crane or a tractor or whatever, and there's marsh. So what do you do? You get a big old, uh, um, excavator and you float it on a little raft and you put the raft right here and you go hey dude go scoop out some of that mud and so you scoop out this mud you scoop out this mud right here and then the arm turns and dumps then you go another foot or so do the same thing scoop and dump so you both create a canal now we can now we can float the boat or the barge in the middle there and we have a raised area so back in the day, way back when, when this was invented to destroy the forests of Louisiana, this was invented to, to clear cut these forests or harvest the valuable timber. And back then we didn't have mechanical stuff. So then what we do is we put, we put um, uh, you know, horses on here and the horses would pull the barge up. So, um, so yeah, so I look at this picture, you can tell that there's, this is a legacy of human history. So here we go, here's another example. Here is, here's, uh, okay, this looks sort of natural. Here we go, here we have some of our natural sinuosity. This is a natural channel, here's a natural channel. But then we have stuff like this, look, artificial, artificial canal. So it's been dredged, it's very straight. And all that sediment has been dumped here and built up these, 
uh, these channels here. Same thing here and on and on and on. So Katrina exacerbated what was already going on. Katrina didn't start the problem. Um, we'll take a break in one second. And so, um, so this is, let's, let's look at this. So here's, here's what I'm showing you, the, the, the southeast area of Louisiana. Here's, here's again, Lake Pontchartrain, here's New Orleans, here's the Bird's Foot Delta. Let's look at these things which we have, which we don't have here. So many of you guys have never seen these. This is an east coast phenomenon, a, a, a shallow coast phenomenon. We have so-called barrier islands where it's so shallow the sand builds up in a shoal and breaks the surface of the, of the water. So when we talk about speed bumps of wetlands, these are also speed bumps because they act as, as, as breaks on the surface of the ocean. So we'll zoom in, this is what they look like. Here's sand, right? So this is pure, like a nice pretty beach. Behind it are wetlands, coastal salt marsh, right? And so this is what the area looked like before Katrina. And so uh, we're zooming into this area right here. And this yellow arrow is for reference. So this is, 2000, this is an image from 2001. So again, you see, the, you see the sand beach here and then the backside are all these wetlands. And here's another area again in 2001. This is what happened with Katrina right after Katrina. So it, it jumped us forward, depends on what metric we're talking, but it jumped us forward at least several decades in terms of wetland loss by that one storm. And it does all kinds of stuff like rip out the, the wetlands, just the wind itself will rip stuff out. And it goes on and on and on and on. Um, uh, so for example, some communities were just simply removed from the face of the earth. This is uh, Holly Beach that we checked out in 2006. This was people sometimes, some people call this the Redneck Riviera. This is, this is an area where folks that weren't wealthy, but maybe wanted to have a, like a place when it was crazy hot inland to come to. So they came to these areas. Now this is not California coast. It's hard to explain to you guys, but this stop sign, well, this is also super surreal when we're driving through. So we're, this is, we're here about six months after, almost a year after Katrina. And it was like a twilight zone because there, was stop, there were stop signs, there were um, uh, fire hydrants, but everything else had been remo just literally removed. So there were streets, but it was, it was like some weird, bizarre, uh, bizarre place. And this is maybe, this, this, this uh, fire hydrant here is maybe three or four feet above sea level. So it's a very, very shallow. And in this case, this, this place was mostly devastated three weeks after Katrina by a storm, a hurricane called Rita that came right in the wake of Katrina. Uh, Katrina went up the sort of New Orleans, Mississippi uh, side of Louisiana. R Rita went up the Texas side of, of uh, Louisiana. And so it just removed this whole community. And so in their wisdom, they'd come in and the public works people, you know, in the months after, say, oh, they better put up the stop signs so everyone behaves safely, right? So um, strange things. Um, again, this is a human dominated system. And this is uh, the challenge with New Orleans. I, I keep talking about New Orleans today, but, but again, this is a problem across the region. But New Orleans was this basically bowl. And so if we do a cross section, this is the challenge that, that managers were facing and that managers are facing. So here's a cross section. So this, from our map, this is the lake, this is the river. So again, here's the river, here's the lake, here's a cross section. This is the situation that we're in. So um, about half of the city of New Orleans is below sea level. The city was not built below sea level. The city was built essentially when it was roughly at sea level or a little bit above. That subsidence thing we talked about has allowed the city to sink. And so people weren't stupid. They didn't build their city below sea level. They built their city. And then because of these management practices, the city has been sinking. And so some areas of the city are 14 feet below sea level. Most are not, most are not that, that, that low, but, but um, it's a huge challenge. And so the response has been to put up a levee that gives us some, some uh, um, that is the flood wall, technically is the flood wall, and put up a flood wall. And so it holds back these things, but you better trust that these things that B and A are kicking butt. Because they're not kicking butt, you're having problems. So the other thing to explain um, real quickly is that what happened was the Mississippi River did not flood the city, even though that was the higher water level. And it's higher because it's flowing into the ocean. So by definition, the river has to be higher than the ocean. What basically happened was we mostly flooded from, 
from here. We mostly flooded from the lake. These, the, this levee system broke and flooded. Again, well known. Here's an animation from NASA. This is, this is long before Katrina happened. This is just running simple GIS. Here we're raising the water level and raise it to about four or five meters and the whole city is gone. So this is a, a geography of vulnerability. Just like we live in this geography of vulnerability in terms of wildfire. Um, this is not unknown to people. A hurricane needs a bunch of things to happen or it will not occur. So all these things have to happen. If that recipe isn't completed correctly, you don't get your, you don't get your cookies. So the first thing is we need a warm ocean. That means the surface, you know, the, the top foot of the ocean basically. And in our case has to be, you know, on the order of 80 degrees Fahrenheit or more. The hotter it is, the better. The deeper down that layer of, um, of warmth, the better. Next, the atmosphere has to have a strong gradient. And so that's going to act just like a chimney in your fireplace. So if, you know, if you guys try to start a fire and it's just, sometimes if it's just like, say, on your, not that you set your kitchen table on fire, but you know, <laughs> if we try to start a fire, it kind of go and whatever. Whereas if we did in the fireplace with, with all the, f the flu and everything open, it, the, the air is going to move and it's going to you know, act like a, uh, a bellows to blow on that fire. So we need that. Um, we have to have uh, moisture uh, in the troposphere. That's going to essentially act as more fuel. And we need some amount of, of, of spinning of what you guys might think of as the Coriolis effect, some amount of torquing. So that means if we're right at the equator, you, you will never have, an, you never have a hurricane, at least starting at the equator. It just, the, the winds don't turn the right way. Next, we need something, and we don't really understand this step five. Um, a lot of research is focused on dust particles coming off the Sahara, coming off of Africa. That seems to be related, but we don't exactly fully understand the, the specific trigger uh, of these events. But it's something. There's some kind of, some kind of incident or some kind of situation you know, snaps, and then that starts the whole thing going. And the last thing is we need to make sure there aren't a lot, there isn't a lot of wind shear. Meaning, so this thing, you can imagine it just as this, as this little baby storm is starting to spin, it's a cyclonic thing. So it's a spinning around type phenomenon. So just as you're starting that spinning, if something comes in and <laughs> blows it, blows it, you know, blowing from the side to side and, and, and messes you up, it's not gonna get into that sort of whirlpool thing. Just like if you guys, uh, let's say we're taking a bath and we, we, we pulled the drain plug, right? Sometimes the water just goes down, but if you kind of spin your finger around the drain plug, you can make that little, that little spinning vortex. Um, and that's great. So you can imagine that's what's sort of happening with a hurricane. But if you, when you were trying to make it spin, if you kind of you know, dropped a toy or whatever in the, the, into the tub, it's going to create some crosswinds and it's going to not make that, that spin. It's not going to allow that spinningness to feed upon itself. Okay, in 2005, we had a bunch of things that were saying, oh my God, it's going to be a crazy year. So the first is this long-term pattern. This is, this is separate from climate change and other things. Um, but we were entering a, a much more active period of storms. Okay. Uh, and we were in that period since 95, and over the, over, in that era, only the El Nino years, which, um, you know, we, we're, we know the El Nino effects here in California, in Southern California, which is basically a lot more water. You guys will see that in a, in a, in a month or two. But um, one of the consequences on, over in the Atlantic is it, is it essentially um, is counterproductive to hurricane formation. So with the exception of those El Nino years, we were in an overactive year, overactive period, above average period. Next, in 2005, that year, we had um, much warmer SST, which is sea surface temperature. So the, so the surface of the ocean was hotter. And we had really favorable winds and air pressure. So we didn't have any of those winds, those cross winds that were gonna knock down the storm formation. So all that was leading everyone to say, oh my God, look out. 
we predict, we have, there's two prediction times that we do. And there's actually two entities that do this. There's an entity in Colorado, there's an entity in Florida that, that generate um, hurricane predictions before the hurricane season. So managers can sort of know to plan for stuff. Before the start of the hurricane season, we, we were predicting we were going to be 175% above, not normal, above a hyperactive season. So all the bells and whistles were being rung and saying, hey, 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 it's going to be a crazy year. It's going to be a crazy year. So have a look at this, you guys. This, I know this looks sort of intimidating and daunting, but let's look at this. Tropical storm, same thing as a hurricane, same thing as a major hurricane, just a difference in intensity. It's the same phenomenon. So tropical storm, not, not as fast. Hurricanes, faster, stronger winds. Major hurricanes, really stronger winds. A hurricane is the same thing as a typhoon. Typhoon are what we call them when they're in the South Pacific. Hurricane are what we call them when they're basically near the US. So let's have a look at this. This is uh, 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 below, uh, so let's talk about a near normal season. These are all the meteorologist terms for stuff. So near normal season. So we would get, um, and this is for North Atlantic. So this is the, the area that would affect Florida, Louisiana, uh, 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 South Carolina, that, that part of the world. We would expect to get in a normal year, something like uh, uh, during hurricane season, about a little more than nine tropical storms, something like five hurricanes, five or six hurricanes, and maybe one or two, what we would call a major hurricane, a really strong hurricane. <clears throat> An above normal season would be something like, uh, uh, okay, so let's talk about the range. But, so the range would be anywhere from 6 to 14 tropical storms, 4 to 8 hurricanes, 1 to 3 major hurricanes. Okay. An above normal season would be something like 10 to 9, 10 to, let's call it 10 to 20 tropical storms, 6 to 12 hurricanes, or 2 to 8 major hurricanes. The prediction, okay, the prediction before the hurricane season started in 2005 was that we would have 18 to 21 tropical storms. That's insane. 9 to 11 hurricanes. That's crazy. And 5 to 7 major hurricanes. That is crazy. What we actually saw was this. We saw 28 tropical storms. We saw 15 hurricanes and we saw 7 major hurricanes. We name these storms when they become um, a hurricane or a tropical storm. We name them by international convention. And so that's why you see sometimes guys' names, sometimes ladies' names. And they're named by an international agreement by all the, all the countries that are affected. And so we take turns. This country gets a name at this year, this country. And we agree on these names ahead of time. This was the first time in history that we went through the entire alphabet and we ran out of names. There was no procedure. No one ever thought we'd ever have more than you know, an A through Z storm. So then we started calling them the alpha, the beta. The, you know, we, 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 this, was, this was an unprecedented year in terms of stuff happening. Um, here is some images, uh, essentially right before Hurricane Katrina hit. And so what we're looking at here, this is the, the, just the outright average sea surface temperature. And you can see the hot, the close, so, so blue cold, red hot. Uh, the equator obviously is warmer than the areas away from the equator, but check it out. It's hot. And then as we get into the area where we're worried about here in terms of the com our conversation today, it's getting hotter. And so it's hottest right there. So the, the hurricane is not losing fuel. It's getting stronger and stronger fuel. And if you look at the anomalies, the differences from background, we see the same story. It's, it's most anomalous right in where the hurricane is heading towards. So it's not losing strength as it's heading towards the coast. It's going to be gaining strength. We also have lower uh, vertical wind shear. So this is going to, again, uh, not help us. It's gonna, it's gonna, it was acting to not break down the hurricanes they were starting. This is what Hurricane Katrina looked like uh, when it was a Category 5. It, it um, became a Category 5, which is the largest category we currently have. There's, there's lots of talk about using a different way to, to name storms and categorize storms. But basically, the category we have comes from these guys that work for the Red Cross. These guys that work for the Red Cross in Central America that were trying to come up with a way to help 
managers respond to hurricane disasters. And they, they uh, in looking at a bunch of data, they said, ah, the wind speed is really important because a lot of those uh, poor communities in Central America have very flimsy houses. They have a lot of like corrugated roof, roof places. And they said, ah, the wind is a huge player. So they created the, our modern uh, uh, categorization of storms based on wind speed. Katrina points out something that we uh, really look at. Look how big this is. This thing goes from the major, not not the winds, but just the major, the the the, the primary storm is stretching from basically Florida to Texas. The storm was incredibly large. That's not accounted for in the typical categorization scale. And a lot of people have now said we need a we need a scale that encompasses you know the size and all these other things other than just wind speed. But in any event, this one was a category five. You see the classic I right there. And this is what happens. So here's, here's a time lapse. So here's, here's the hurricane. It's going to start over here. It's going to start coming to the Bahamas. It's going to nub the bottom of Florida. It's going to go in and it's going to go right up. So let's watch this. So here it comes. This is time lapse, obviously. Boom, tightens up. Boom, here comes the I. Becomes a category five and then whoop, right on up. Let's watch it again. So here it comes. Boom, boom, boom. Forms, tightens up, getting stronger and stronger winds. The eye forms, this is super strong. Boom. Goes straight on up. And in almost, it could have been a little teeny bit worse. It was almost the worst possible situation for the city of New Orleans. Now, here, here's the storm is about to make landfall. It's important to say one of the key things you will hear in this next week as you read all these stories that I'll post and other people will be posting. People will say, we didn't design, we didn't design the levee system to protect from a category five storm. So it's not our fault. That's what the Army Corps says. Um, the technical term is misleading for that. They were charged by Congress with building a storm protection system that would protect the city of New Orleans from a category three storm. And so their argument was not our fault, a category five. By the time the storm got to over here, got to over um, uh, Lake Pontchartrain, which was causing the flooding, it was a category one storm. So when the flooding happened to the city of New Orleans, it was a category one storm, supposedly well within the design standards of the federal agency that designs the levees, that certify the levees that protect campus here, that protect Camarillo, that same entity that protect the Delta that provides about a third of our drinking water here in Ventura County. That might give you pause if these supposed competent engineers couldn't figure stuff out. And I have to be careful, otherwise I'll talk the whole time about how incompetent the Army Corps of Engineers are. Anyway, so here we go. So, so the storm is coming. We recorded the highest storm surge ever in North America with this storm. So, that was, so it, was, it was about 22 feet in some of the communities that we work on rebuilding in, in Buras and these other places. But here it was 30 feet. Let me explain what storm surge is. Storm surge kind of sounds like, oh, I jumped in the bathtub and there's a little, oh, and I got hit by a wall and I went back. No, storm surge is the lump of water that's going to build up in front of this, this storm. Okay. Now, it's not a permanent wall of water, but in the case of this storm, it took many hours to go from here to here. So by surge, we're talking about several hours of surge. So this 30 feet, it didn't go, didn't start at zero. 30 feet water like a tidal wave come up and then go down. This was hours of water above. Again, this is not the California coast that you guys are used to. This is flat pancake land, right? Where your house might be, I don't know, five feet above sea level or something like that, right? So 30 feet above sea level, the, your entire town is below water. Your water tower, which is probably the highest thing in your town, that might be underwater. This is crazy, crazy high. Um, a major challenge for anybody uh, living in this region. Um, is this animation going to work? Yeah, I don't know why my animations aren't working. But basically, this is a model that just showed what happened in terms of flooding. Um, here is the disaster area relative to us. So here's, here is in the proper scale. Here's California. And this is the disaster zone in the immediate wake of Katrina. So we have a little team down here in Florida, which was declared a couple days earlier. So I, I've not colored that red. But of the, of the part that, of the storm when it hit the mainland uh, Louisiana and uh, Mississippi, 
that's a huge area. Check it out. This is like going from, say, San Diego to, say, almost San Jose. That's a huge area being impacted. Um, uh, we're we're going to run out of time here, but just to suffice it to say, there was several different aspects to this storm. There was the initial impact that we all see and we'll see in these documentaries these next few days, which is just the outright, the physical brunt of the storm, breaking infrastructure, causing problems, those yahoos from the Weather Channel, like, it's really blowing out here, I don't think I can stand on the beach anymore, right, that dramatic footage of that kind of stuff. Then the storm passed. I have to reiterate, there's the story of New Orleans, there's the story of the rest of the area. Most of the attention goes to New Orleans because that's where our big population center is. That's where everybody goes on vacations, and it's understandable why that happens. But there's also all the stories of people outside of that big major area. There was flooding elsewhere, but most places outside of Louisiana, basically the places that weren't protected by the Army Corps of Engineers, that flood came in, that flood went away. It caused all kinds of damage, to be sure. But the flooding that you will hear about that was essentially the bowl that we talked about, New Orleans being a bowl. We punctured the sides and allowed the water to flood in. So that flooding was caused by the failed flood protection system. Uh, and so that flooding is a whole other thing. What we're looking at here, this is, I can't remember, this looks like to me 17th Street. It might be London. I think it's the 17th Street Canal. I think it's 17th Street. Okay, there you go. So 17th Street. So what we're seeing here is this is now as we've started to pump the city dry now this is a, a dr essentially a drainage canal where we have pumps down to the right of this picture and we're sucking the water out and so the water is now draining from the city and it's 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 going out in this case this is during the early part of the flooding this is a canal this this looks like london to me too and um and so this flooded and what we see here this is a flood wall this was a straight line on this side you can see it's intact see it's straight here so it was straight here, and this just, the entire thing, it was like a big giant, picked it up and just smooshed it. Oops, sorry, what did I do? Smooshed it, and this tree, for example, moved. And so, so you see here the water rushing out of the canal into the city. In this case, we're draining the city. But in general, everything is being flooded. So if we look down at the city, again, here is the big lake. And then here's a road. Here's a uh, levee around the lake. A levee is a natural mound of dirt. A flood wall is something we add on top of that levee. And so what you're seeing here, look close, looks like, oh, there's some stuff. If we actually look really close, what you're seeing is uh, the roofs of most of these houses are on top of them. To be sure, there's some damage. There's some missing tiles. But generally speaking, the roofs are intact. If the storm had killed these people, had killed nearly 2,000 American citizens. And you would expect, there's, oh my God, these houses got blown away. No. The roofs are generally intact. What is, what is happening is, okay, so here, here, here this roof obviously lost some tiles. But what you're seeing instead is inundation. This flooding was happening. So if you owned a home and you had flood insurance, mostly they gave you the big finger. And they said, we're not paying for this. Why? Because this is not an act of God. This is an act of flooding that was caused by the flood levy, the flood protection system failing. Okay, who's in charge of the flood protection system? The Army Corps of Engineers. Hey, Army Corps of Engineers, can you give me some money because my house flooded? Sorry, you can't sue the federal government. That is literally what happened. There's, there's all kinds of other nuances and stuff, but that is what happened. So in an American city, people that had purchased their homes, worked hard every day, paid off their mortgages, weren't criminals, weren't, weren't, weren't Wall Street swindlers or anything like that, had, had made their home, had made their payments. God knows if they'd missed one of their insurance payments, they'd have been screwed, right? But they did their payments, and the insurance industry basically determined, ah, not our fault. And so these folks were in a true catch-22. So the management challenges in this context extended beyond the actual disaster. We've still yet to come truly to terms with how to deal with this. And we'll talk about that later in the semester as well. This is a diagram from the New York Times, which is from several years ago, which is great. It shows the 
levy for the, the flood protection system. Again, up here is the lake. Here is the Mississippi River. Here are what used to be the wetlands. And, and you don't need to focus on it. You just need to note that it's a lot of stuff. This is a complex system. Each of these little black boxes represents a hole or a break in the levee. There were breaks all over the place, up, down, right, left. Some were because of problem one, some were because of problem two, but ultimate, some were caused because they didn't use the right datum. They thought they were uh, several feet higher than they actually were because they didn't take our intro to GIS class and figure out that was important. Other cases, they didn't build it properly. Other cases, it was not designed properly. There were no shortage of a host of reasons. This is an incredible photo, and we're about out of time here, but this is, this is an insane photo. This is, I can't believe that someone survived to take this picture, but we're essentially in the city now, looking, looking into the lake. It looks like the ocean, because it's so roiling, but this is a lake, and this is the top of the levee. This is the ocean pouring over this levee. This is like end of the world biblical kind of times. Um, if you guys are interested, I would encourage you to consider applying. Uh, I, I heard that we got funding again for our, our annual trip, which is great. I never know if we're going to get funding, but we got funding. If you guys are interested in this particular story, you should consider coming with us to Louisiana this spring break. It's a three-unit class uh, that I teach. And we do, uh, we do wetland restoration. We used to do home rebuilding. Now we install food gardens in, in poor neighborhoods. So we do a lot of stuff. We meet with... Uh, uh, jazz musicians and scientist friends of ours and, and reporters and all kinds of great stuff. But um, one of the things we'll do if you guys come with me is we'll go on a levee failure tour. It's taught by a friend of mine from Tulane University and it's great. And one of the, the things that's the most craziest thing in the world is this. This is the Orleans Canal. So here is, the, to the right is a bunch of homes. Going off this way is the lake. So this again is the drainage canal that is gonna drain the city. Um, so this is a levee, again, the earthen mound is a levee. There are natural levees around rivers, but hum we can also dump dirt and we can, we can add to the levee. So this is a levee. And then because you need to go up, we have need to go out to the side four feet for every foot that you go up to make these things be stable. It's hard to make these things big. Because then you need, you know, we need to buy this land over here. It need to take up a lot of land. So in areas like urban areas where space is at a premium, we typically have a levee and then have this, which is a flood wall. So, right? In theory, this protects this, this city if the water gets this high. Except, if you guys come with me, we go here. If we were standing here, your butt would be facing a brick wall. And that brick wall was an old, an old pumping station from the 1800s. And that pumping station not just, not just only moved water around, it also was the sewage, it also moved sewage around. And so in the infinite wisdom of the designers of this, they decided to not extend <laughs> this flood wall to connect it up to behind my butt where I'm taking this picture, which is the, which is the brick wall of the, of the pump house. Why? Oh, because if it floods, and this breaks, and this thing here breaks, it might rip out the wall, and it might break the wall, and then the, then the poop would get in the water. Are you kidding me? So we built this with all of your money. We built this entire flood protection that doesn't do crap. Because the weakest link, right? If we have 10 miles of this that's whatever, four feet high, but then over here it's only, it's zero feet high, guess what? It's not gonna protect you from a four foot flood. What? That is crazy. My son, a kindergartner, a baby, could figure out that this is probably not going to be effective flood protection. How was it that folks in powers said that was an acceptable thing to do? You might as well have not put anything on here, right? It does nothing. So poor management. And then we could talk about why the levees failed and all this kind of stuff. Uh, obviously, there's all kinds of consequences to this. We're running out of time here today. We're, we're done for today. But, but I just want to, let's see if we can wrap up with um, um, talking about how we perceive the environment. When this first happened, 
the environment was absolutely seen as the danger thing. So these are the pictures that were circulating in the media. Oh my God, snake, or, you know, oh my God, alligators in the city, oh my God, wild dogs, oh my God, uh, mosquitoes, oh my God, right? A healthy, intact wetland would have helped stop this. When we disassociate ourselves from the thing we're trying to manage, it can lead to false perceptions that then in turn foster even poorer management. So one thing I'll just note here, this is West Nile virus. West Nile virus is uh, a novel thing first introduced or first noticed in the US in 1999. This is a very new thing. We tracked it. We watched the spread of this non-native, if you want to call a virus a species, species across the US. It kills people every year, makes people sick every year. And so because of that, we've started putting out what are called sentinel chickens. Because this, this uh, uh, West Nile virus can live in birds. So we put chickens out and we draw blood from chickens in these cages and then we say, oh, do we have any cases of this? And so this is, and then we can also count them in people. And so these are the number of people that in Louisiana in 2005 before the storm that got, that had West Nile. Uh, so here we go. January, oh, one person did, no, nobody. And so nobody, 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 nobody. nobody. And then, oh my God, getting towards the storm. There's some West Nile. Oh! And we stopped. We stopped counting because the hospitals imploded. Because people couldn't keep track of this stuff anymore. So when this happened, one of the things we decided to do was eliminate a lot of the traditional protections that we had for the environment. So the Bush administration deleted a bunch of protections. Now, some of that was the right thing to do. When you have a city that you need to deposit all the waste from, you can't just use the typical landfill approaches, right? So some of that was reasonable. Other things, maybe not so reasonable. So we were so worried about um, mosquito-borne, water-borne uh, diseases that we just sprayed the heck out of this place. So for example, a friend of mine who's now a professor up in the uh, University of San Francisco who did his PhD in Louisiana, uh, a little bit later told me the story that um, I always tell, that um, uh, he went back and this is, this is you know, in the time after Katrina, he's hanging with a friend of his and they're out on a, his friend's porch and the porch is screened off because it, you know, can be hot at night and bugs going around. And they were sitting on the porch and my friend's friend said, do you want a beer? He said, sure, I'll, yeah, get me a beer. So he goes, okay, so he goes inside. So my friend was just sitting there, so he's by himself on the porch, rocking, and it's nighttime, and all of a sudden he stopped. And he got this really weird feeling. Like, you know, like the horror, like the guy's about to stab him in the horror movie, right? And he's, he's saying, what? what, what's going on? And he's sitting there and he's trying to figure it out and he couldn't figure it out. Then he realized right across the street, it was a big giant, um, street light and there were no moths flying around in the light and then they started to listen and there was no buzz of of crickets and and, and, and and insects and stuff and he's like what I've never experienced a night in Louisiana without moths flying around without bugs and that was I mean I can't say for sure but it seems probably pretty likely because we were out just insecticiding everywhere and there's a million stories like that that, 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 that came along. So um, I've talked for a long time. Um, this is an important event. We've not recovered fully. We've recovered some aspects of stuff. The, the, the levee protection system is, has been repaired. Uh, we're gonna have a, we're gonna have a conference in about a month here. And one of the topics will be, uh, is the, are things working? Um, I would argue that uh, maybe they're not really as good as people would say they, some people would say they are. But at least it's better than it was immediately after Katrina. But our wetlands are worse. We've not been serious about this. So I would argue the city and the region is more vulnerable than it was before. So I've been talking, talking, talking. But I don't know, Vanessa, did you want to say anything about anything? Any, um, I mean, you don't have to. It's OK. Well, are we going to watch something on easy? Yeah. Yeah. That's my favorite document. So um, yeah, so, I'll, uh, so yeah. Um, I'll put some stuff up online. Um, one thing I want to say, that was, so before we go, so our website will be up. Um, so I'll have some stuff related to Katrina I'd like you guys to, to read or watch.